Hey everybody, welcome to the Evangelist Nick Garrett channel. This is podcast number four, insert clapping noise. It's pretty amazing. I'd say each of the three have, uh, you know, had their ups and downs, but we're doing everything we can to learn how this is done. I'll tell you a funny thing that's happening. I am working at it, you know, every free hour of the day. I've got my books out. I'm doing my research to make good content and learn how to uh, make a podcast as an entity that can be successful. And finally today, for the first time, I said, look, I'm going to be shooting a, a couple promos. I'm actually going to take the time and effort to look decent. I'm going to bring down a couple shirts, like a black one, a white one, a blue one. Try them on, see which one looks best. So as I'm sitting there getting ready to start filming, I'm flipping through the books of some of the material we're going to be talking about today. And I look down and I spilled coffee all down my front. And I said, all right, yep, that's how it's going to be today. Anyway, that kind of stuff happens to all of us. So today, my friends, we are going to be asking ourselves the question that has come up historically, maybe more than any other in Christian history, and that is, at least in the modern world, should Western Europeans be apologizing for the Holy, the Holy Land Crusades that happened centuries ago? Let me rephrase that. Should the Western Europeans, the Christian Crusaders, whoever comprised their makeup, should they be apologizing for the Holy Land Crusades to Islam centuries after the fact? Because Answering that question will determine what you ultimately come to believe and understand about the Holy Land Crusades. If you believe that a group of people have a right to reclaim lands that are undoubtedly historically theirs, but it's been five, six hundred, seven hundred years, a thousand years since they have lived there, and another group of people has since migrated there, and they say, this is our space. We've lived here our whole lives. It's all we've ever known. That is the dilemma of the Crusades. And that humanizes both sides because what you end up with is both sides just wanting to protect their families. Most people are blown away when they learn about the reality of the Holy Land Crusades. I was. Let me tell you about how I got into the Crusades. I had just finished seminary, right? And then I, around that same time, started watching a YouTube channel by this guy, J. Stephen Roberts, called Real Crusades History. And after two or three shows, I'm like, man, this is crazy. It's like I'm listening to Dungeons and Dragons. I'm hearing all these names like Hugh, the Lord of such and such, and the Mistress and the Dane, and they took up their swords to fight for the cross of Christ. And I'm like, man, this is like all that old, cool, medieval storytelling. It was the truth. It was what happened. It was our very own history. The history of Europe. And how we ended up being who we were as people. Anyway, I wrote a book called Just Tell Me the Truth About the Crusades. Which stemmed from a much larger book, Just Tell Me the Truth About Christianity. We broke it down into smaller chapters. So... I begin telling my story about the Crusades with the rise of Islam. I don't see how you can't otherwise. That is the catalyst. Christianity had been around for 500 years, give or take, by the time the nation of Islam rose in the deserts of Saudi Arabia. We usually associate Jesus Christ's ministry with the year 0 in 33 AD. Seven centuries have already gone by, so forgive us if we're not like, oh yeah, you and us, we're on that mountain of oldest. No, 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 just us. But no other event changed the trajectory of the Christian religion than the birth of Islam. Modern Westerners seem to fall into two camps in their views on Islam. One view suggests Westerners find little that stirs the soul in the record of Muhammad's revelations collected reverently after his death and incorporated into the 114 surahs of the Quran. It seems to be an incoherent rhapsody of fable, precept, and declamation which sometimes crawls in the dust and is sometimes lost in the clouds. Through every impossible sacrifice, Muhammad was his own greatest contribution to the faith. That is a quote from the history of the Jews 
by Abram Leon Sakar. Among Christians, views on Islam are also quite mixed. Surprisingly, not all Christian denominations believe Christians alone can attain salvation. In fact, most believe otherwise. Let me say that again. If we wonder why the world's main religions are fighting with each other today, let me read this again. Among Christians, views on Islam are also quite mixed. Surprisingly, not all Christian denominations believe Christians alone can attain salvation. In fact, most believe otherwise. It would likely surprise many to learn that number 841 in the Catholic Catechism says, quote, The plan of salvation also includes those who acknowledge the Creator, the first place amongst whom are the Muslims. These profess to hold the faith of Abraham, and together with us they adore the one merciful God, mankind's judge on the last day. Catholics are not even alone in their view. What I just read to you is the major institutional clerical division of Christianity saying, oh yeah, yeah, Muslims are saved too. Well, first of all, thank God, because it tells us we do have a gracious God, if that's the truth. But on the other hand, this might be one reason why there seems to be all this incompatibility between these two groups of God's children. Anyway, we cover Islam's rise, how they essentially occupy most of the Middle East, East Africa, the Levant, and are moving their way into North Africa only 100 years after forming in the 1630s. They got a lot of good practice after a century alone when they had taken most of the land that they could see. And they were getting ready to take Israel and in so doing, they took Jerusalem, the capital of the Jewish faith, the capital of the Christian faith. And I'm sorry, sometimes I do believe that young people coming up today don't realize why this is important. For Christians, Jesus Christ was nailed to a cross and killed in the execution yard outside Jerusalem. That is why we want that kept for us. It is one of the last physical, tangible places on earth people can go and remember the miracle that was done on earth before secularism wipes it away from the planet. That's the bottom line. Anyway, we talk a little bit next in this book about Islamic encroachment on Europe. So by the early 700s, Islam had their eyes on Spain, uh, particularly uh, northern Morocco in Africa, uh, was looking up across the Mediterranean, the Iberian Peninsula and the country of Spain. Portugal was not a country yet and saying, hey, I bet you we could take all that because most of the people there are already with us in already with us because they're sick of living under the Visigoths and their life sucks. Two, they don't care who's ruling them. They're just starving and want to eat and live. And three, I just think we can take it. So they do. It is called the beginning of the Spanish Reconquista, 723 A.D., the modern book of our time that got popular on this subject was by a Yale professor who, uh, God love the woman, has gone home, had a horrible brain tumor, uh, and she passed away. Uh, I was very critical of her work, but I don't wish that on anyone. The woman had a family, and I hope that our Lord welcomed her into his kingdom. Anyway, her book is called An Ornament of the World, and it talked about this beautiful multicultural uh, medieval Spain and oh everybody was so happy under Islamic rule and oh the world was just peaches and cream uh, until you actually go back and pick up the primary sources written by the Spanish that were living there at the time the Jews the Christians the wealthy the poor because the records are voluminous that means there's a whole lot of them and I've read some of them, and they tell of the atrocities that happened, and I mean atrocities that go beyond 
the atrocities of war. They were taken to whole new levels. Anyway, Tariq Ibn Ziyad leads his men through the Spanish countryside, the city side, takes it in no time at all. Now you have a situation where not only has Islam in less than a few centuries taken every square foot of land from Saudi Arabia north to the doorstep of Europe, France, that's all that stands in their way. But the reason class that we hear about people like Pepin the Great and Charles Martel and Charlemagne, oh my God, they were nothing but the patriarchy and that's why we learn about them. No, we learned about them because after 400 years, they were the only European soldiers whose men and leaders worked together to hold off a complete Muslim invasion that had literally failed everywhere else for the past four centuries. They are worthy of honor, and that's why we remember them. And that's exactly what Charlemagne did. He held back the Muslim invasion from France. And Islam then knew, we cannot go past this line. That set the stage for Pope Urban II to arrive. When he comes into his papacy in the late 1090s AD, there are very tumultuous times. There's still this situation where does the Pope live in Avignon, France, or does he live in Rome? Everything is very factionalized. They're playing for the first time and exploring the idea of establishing a college of cardinals who will vote to make decisions. You have the Holy Roman Emperor involved. You have all these political interests that have no idea what the other ones are doing. Communication is hard during this time. And along comes a man named Pope Urban II, and he knew this. He knew that the Muslims were getting ready to pour over the border in Byzantium, the eastern end of the Christian Empire. They didn't get along west and east, but they were a loose brotherhood by the Christian affiliation. And the Muslims were getting ready to overtake their borders. And Prince Alexios I Komnenos rose to power in Byzantium. And one of the first things he did in his leadership was send two men to Pope Urban II's council at Piacenza. I want you to think about what this says. You are Pope Urban II. You are sit sitting on the throne in court. You are receiving guests from all over the world. And the next thing you know, you hear the courtiers say, Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, these are two representatives from Prince Alexios I Komnenos of the Byzantine Christian Empire. He sends his two emissaries in peace, my lord. Those words hadn't been uttered in a long time. And right away, I can promise you there were cardinals staring at each other saying, what the hell is going on here? But the writing had been on the wall for a long time. In fact, uh, Robert of Flanders had come to Jerusalem in 1087 AD to fight alongside Alexios in a little field action, which they, uh, the historians treated it very much like a fox hunt. This was not um, as serious as maybe some of the later battles. But I think the point that's being made is they are starting to test the waters. Charlemagne held them back in France. You inspired generations over the next several hundred years. History changed. A new pope comes on board. We start to see unity and pride in the Christian church. And now we're heading back to the Holy Land. So for weeks, Pope Urban II rode around Europe, jotting down notes to a speech that he would give at the upcoming Council of Clermont in France. And uh, 
I think he spent a lot of time on this speech. They knew this speech was going to be well attended because they built a riser, a dais, they put up chairs. At least the church's history says this. I have no reason not to believe it. Unless some nerdy monk is going to sit there and try to say, oh boy, uh, let's make this event sound bigger than it really was or people are going to think the church is a lie. You know, that's the kind of stuff we get today, such weak arguments. Anyway. Pope Urban II makes his speech at Claremont and he asked people to take up the cross for God, for themselves, for the Lord Jesus Christ. God commands it. God wills it. Your brothers and sisters are in trouble. He appeals to scripture. He appeals to the chaos in the period of time immediately after the crucifixion. When things were in disarray and he said all we had was each other. And your brothers in the east need your help. They're being taken down time and time again in battle. And let me tell you, his speech worked. He even had the catchy little title. When you went to sign on the dotted line to go die for the church, you were taking the cross. But imagine going home and saying, Mom, Dad, I'm taking the cross. The amount of pride that went with that for that particular family. I'm taking the cross. I am going to fight for Christ. Where do we see that type of value embedded in Western culture today? In military families. We honor our veterans. Right? So, that's for the next person that tries to tell you our Christian values are not embedded in our everyday society because they are. Anyway. So among the first to first two to take up the cross were Adamar, the Bishop of Le Puy, and Raymond, the fourth Count of Toulouse. I mean, come on, that is a name. Raymond, the fourth Count of Toulouse. That sounds like either the awesomest thing I've ever heard in my life or the dorkiest thing I've ever heard in my life. It can work one of two ways. You walk up to somebody on a street corner. Hey, what's up, man? What's your name? Yeah, I'm Richard the Fourth Count of Toulouse. Half the people would be like, damn, that's a pretty bad name. That name's pretty badass, no lie. And the other half of the people would be like, Richard the Fourth Count of Toulouse? You are such a loser. So that would be fun to see. Anyway, they're the first two to take the cross. After you took the cross... You coordinated with the local lord or the local parish or the local church. And the lords, the liege lords, and the heads of the military would coordinate with the heads of the clergy in given towns to enroll people into their crusader force. Two of the very first things to happen, though, were precisely the opposite. And this is where Game of Thrones gets it right. It's almost... Sounds like the story they tell about the wildlings. Anyway. Religious zealots take a group of people and lead them on their own unsanctioned crusade where they say we're going to do things our own way. They break all kind of social and diplomatic protocol that was being built for this whole thing to work in the first place and ended up getting them killed in the field well before their time. Anyway. Who do we end up with? We end up with Raymond, the fourth count of Toulouse. We end up with Adamar, Bishop of Le Puy. We have all of these forces now arriving in and around Constantinople and setting up camp. And the lords and their retinues and their courtiers and their entourages are being led to dinner inside with Prince Alexios Komnenos. Only this dinner is not to feed them because they are so tired from their long journey. There is a political purpose to this dinner. And the political purpose to this dinner is for Alexios I Komnenos to get an oath of fealty from the Christian Western Roman Crusaders that are coming into his land to help him. But he's still going to get an oath that says, look, you ain't taking my lands and my stuff. 
All right, fine. That's how the oath works. Most people take it and there's no problem. At the end, we get the morality story of the Middle Ages where Raymond IV challenged him, though, and said, well, if you're not willing to, you know, uh, come and fight alongside us, why should we be willing to take an oath of fealty for you? And both men grow in Western morals and the world is a better place. Next to arrive in the Crusader camp is somebody who's got to have a mention of his own because the dude's name was Bohemond of Taranto. Remember that thing I was saying earlier about how some of these names like kind of lame and it could go either way. You could either sound like a badass or someone who's about to get beat down without mercy. This one, no, there's no plan around this one. This dude's name was Bohemond of Taranto. That's pretty, that's, I'm just saying. Little brother, maybe I can see him getting a beat down. His, another, his name's Tancred. That's a bad nerd name right there, Tancred. You know, Tancred was all right, though, because if someone messed with Tancred, Bohemond of Taranto would come for him. <laughs> Sounds like that dude from the Game of Thrones. Um, what's his name? The Mountain. Sir Gregor Clegane. I swear, that's 90% of Game of Thrones. We could recreate it this way. One, you just got to make the pouring wine sound like 50 times. Every five seconds, there's got to be a glass of wine pouring. Have you ever noticed that in that show? That's all you ever hear. You'll hear him say something like, Did they go to Pentos? Yes, my lord. It's like an hour of that, and then 10 minutes of just the most insane violence you can comprehend. I mean, this guy, the mountain, Sir Grigol Clegane, literally crushes this guy's head with his fist like a watermelon. I mean, I I'm not going to lie. Look, <laughs> I'm a devout Christian, but one of my failings is definitely uh, lust of the eyes. I straight up love Game of Thrones. That is one of those shows that just... I love it because I work in politics, so to see all the intrigue taking place behind the scenes and uh, predicting what might happen, um, you know, I, I'm not a fan of sci-fi or fantasy per se, so it was kind of weird for me how it seemed like a normal show for the first three seasons, and then I watched season four and all of a sudden there's dragons and magic and all kinds of crazy stuff happening, um, but for the most part I love it. Oh, yeah, yeah, Sir Gregor Clegane. Uh, what, Sandal the Hound? Oh, Sandal Clegane. Okay, so right now we are at the doorstep of Constantine. We have a the fourth on the inside of the division. We have a Western Crusader army arriving and setting up camp around the wall. Ready to head out into the hot Anatolian desert to face down a man named Kili Arslan, the Sultan of Rum. No, guys, no, we're not doing it again. Oh my god, look, it's Kili Arslan, the Sultan of Rum. No, that's one of those badass ones. What's your name? I am Kili Arslan, the Sultan of Rum. Can you imagine having all those titles and stuff? Oh, I can't believe it. Anyway. We're going to learn about that. We're going to learn about the Battle of Dory Lamb. And we're going to see how this unassuming, out-of-nowhere group of Christian crusaders from Europe best the nomads on their own turf in the deserts of Arabia. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to talking to you next time.